very much for the introduction and thanks everyone for coming. I'm delighted to tell you today about science we can do from 90 South, from the South Pole, so that where we can study from the beginning of the universe to the end. So the first thing I want you to know, so whenever you listen to a talk, you'll typically take away three things. So I'm going to tell you what I want you to take away. I don't know if you will, but I'm going to tell you what I want you to take away. And the first thing is this. I'm a cosmologist. And in cosmology, we can't control our experiments. I can't roll a ball across the table multiple times and measure it again and again and again. What we're given is what we can observe in the universe. And what we can observe is what we can see from a planet that orbits a pretty ordinary star that's orbiting itself at the center of a pretty ordinary galaxy. Now, nature has given us a gift in the form of what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. We're light from X-rays to radio waves probes different physical processes. And with these processes, we can really probe the different physics and understand what's going on in our universe. The second point, getting to a way at the beginning, is that when we study the universe, we're really looking back in the past. All our telescopes are time machines. So I'm looking at you in the back of the room. I'm seeing you as you were about 10 nanoseconds ago. When we look at the sun, we see the sun as it was eight minutes ago, the distant side of our galaxy a hundred light years ago. And when I look at distant galaxies, I'm looking at them as they were billions of years ago. We're really reading the history of our universe when we study the sky. And the part of the sky I study is based on this. This is a map taking away the contributions from our local galaxy of the temperature of the sky, a very high precision map of the temperature of the sky. And it looks pretty boring, right? But this is actually one of the most profound measurements we have made in the last decade in cosmology. This is telling you that the temperature at that side of the universe and at that side of the universe is exactly the same, even though light would take more than the age of the universe to travel from one side to the other. Now we know the universe has been quite this boring. I exist, you exist, stars, planets, comets exist. So if we make ever more detailed measurements of the sky like this in the millimeter wavelengths, what you see is this. This is now cranking the contrast of this image up 100,000 times. These are small temperature fluctuations that took us three few decades after the discovery of this light to really see. And these are the small fluctuations that we have to connect to what we see from here. Oh, the screen's not great, sorry. To what we see when we observe the sky with like the Hubble Space Telescope. So this now, I'm going to describe it to you since so you can't see it too well, is a picture of the moon. It's about half a degree across. And then if you look very deeply in a tiny patch, you see millions of galaxies. With these observations, we can see that the universe is full of hundreds of billions of galaxies, each of those galaxies containing hundreds of billions of stars. So when we come up with our models of how the universe forms and evolves, we have to connect measurements with these small fluctuations into the rich diversity of galaxies and other structures we see today. And we have done that very successfully to date. This is a model we have been working on as scientists for a few decades now. And that's what's known as the hot big bang model of the universe. So we believe the universe began as an explosion of space. Space itself exploded. It didn't explode from a point. Space itself exploded and very, very, very rapidly expanded. Those initially very distant parts of the, what we showed distant parts of the universe were once in contact. As space expanded, it then cooled, and eventually we had this soup of protons and electrons and light particles called photons in this plasma that was able to cool we were able to form hydrogen atoms, connecting protons and electrons into neutral hydrogen, and the light was able to stream to us today. So when I showed you that picture of the sky, that was an image of the relic radiation, the baby universe image of the hot big bang. Since then, since today's theme of gravity, the universe has been matter in the universe has been evolving under the influence of gravity. The small one part in a hundred thousand contrast has been growing. Uh, under the influence of gravity to form the first stars, the first galaxies, and then more and larger, larger aggregations of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and other large cosmic structures. 
Now, most of the observations I have shown you today have been from space. That's because space is wonderful. There's no atmosphere to get in the way. We as people love the atmosphere, but as astronomer, atmosphere is my enemy. It tends to block the light, to scatter the light, to get in the way. But there are a few remote sites on Earth where we can actually do the millimeter wave science, the microwave background science, such as you can do from space. And one of those is the South Pole. So much as your microwave oven keeps your food by microwave radiation coming in and introducing rotational motions in the water in your food, the Earth's atmosphere, when that light from the relic light from the Big Bang comes down, it interacts with the water in the Earth's atmosphere, it's scattered, it's distorted, it's, it's just a mess. So to do this science from the ground, we have to go to places where water isn't. And the best site on Earth happens to be at the South Pole. So I can truly say I go to the South Pole for the weather. <laughs> this is now showing you, if you collapse all the water vapor in the atmosphere in Chicago, you get a huge amount, and at the South Pole, it's something like micrometers of water. So the other advantage of going to the South Pole um, compared to space is expensive. I mean, SpaceX is gonna be amazing, but it's expensive to launch big things into space. But on the ground, we can fly them in, we can refuel them, we can grease the bearings, we can fix things when they break. And we do that every awful summer at the South Pole. So if we zoom into this patch here, that is an image of the 10 meter South Pole telescope, and there's the upper scale. So with a big dish, we like big dishes in astronomy because optics says the bigger your dish, the better your resolution. So this is a close zoom in, not of the whole sky now, but of a smaller patch from the NASA WMAP satellite image I showed you at the beginning of this talk. This is now going from WMAP to an updated European mission called PLUMP. And this is now showing you that exact same data as measured by the South Pole Telescope. So for me, it's like putting on my glasses. Everything sharpens into focus. And if we take a more careful look at this, we can see still very well measured relic radiation from that hot Big Bang. We also see these bright emissive sources. These can be dust around the earliest star-forming galaxies in the universe, as well as around the accretion disks, from accretion disks around black holes. And finally, it's a bit hard to see, and they're a bit hard to measure. It's about a few hundred microkelvin temperature difference, a few hundred micro degrees temperature differences, are these shadows on the sky, which are called clusters of galaxies. These are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe, something a few hundred trillion times the mass of our sun, just mind-blowingly enormous. Now, these were incredibly hard to detect. Scientists spent decades looking for these to blindly detect them in surveys. With measurements from the South Pole Telescope, we were able to first detect these in 2009, and technology has been so rapid, we've now found over 100,000 of these systems in the cosmic microwave background sky. These are really powerful because, and this is a science talk, so I'm going to talk you through this plot. This is the one plot I'm showing in this talk. Um, this is now showing you we're tracing the biggest systems in the entire universe across the cosmic time. So normally, like that light up there, it gets fainter the further away in. It goes to something like one over the distance squared. But with these shadow effects on the cosmic wave background, scattering the light from that background radiation, we can detect these independent of distance in an effect called the sinai zeldovich effect. So that means I can detect one of these massive systems if it's right here, or if it's 10 light billion light years away. And this is an incredibly powerful tool. I can now make a census of the biggest things in the universe across cosmic. And that's what you can see here. So starting at the right side of the plot, which is further towards the Big Bang, you see there are some, but there are fewer. Now as the universe evolves, under the influence of gravity, we form more and more big stuff. You can see we get many, many more, and they tend to get bigger. And so we can connect that with our three theoretical models using simulations. I hope this shows up. So this is a simulation made by my colleagues at Argonne showing starting from those initial fluctuations, evolving the universe under the influence of gravity. You can see we form those galaxies, and you can see through mergers and other accretion processes, we form larger and larger structures. Those are clusters of galaxies. 
Now, today's theme is about defying gravity. So I've talked about how gravity causes these large structures to form, and that could be the end of our story. In the 90s, we went out, as astronomers went out, and they wanted to measure uh, the slowing down of the Big Bang, right? You have this big explosion at the beginning of the universe. It's expanding, expanding. Well, there's all this stuff. Eventually, maybe you'll get some contraction because of the force of gravity. Well, what they found was the opposite. There was no contraction. Instead, what they found from observations of these galaxy clusters, from observations of exploding stars and other astronomical objects, was the universe isn't slowing down, it's speeding up. It's like if I rolled a ball across this floor and it suddenly took off. Something's causing it to speed up. That something is called dark energy, and we honestly have no idea what it is. I'm standing up here admitting to you, I don't know what makes up 70% of the universe. Now, whether it's simply a modification of gravity, we can't defy gravity, but we don't understand gravity completely, or whether it requires new physics, is something we need to explore. And so that's where I'm going to end my talk. Just a teaser here of the great science you can do. Um, by just saying there's a lot out there, um, we're building some fantastic telescopes, upgrades to the facilities of the South Pole, as well as new telescopes in Chile, which will survey the whole tonight's nice sky every three days. Data will be available to the public instantly in the 2020s. So we need new ideas. So the third take home point I want you to get from this talk as I end is that we're not done and we need all the bright ideas we can to help us solve this problem.